Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. But you know, alibiers, welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Totally thought it was Thursday until about 30 minutes ago. I was like, what am I going to do this weekend? And then I realized I have two more days to figure it out. That's how my day has gone. Really quick, I want to give a big, big thank you to Terry and someone who did not leave their name for your donations. Really appreciate you guys. Music fact of the day. Queen's collaboration with David Bowie on Under Pressure was totally impromptu. David Bowie just half happened to be by the studio where Queen was recording tracks for their 10th studio album. When both parties decided to work on an original piece during this 24-hour session. Mercury and Bowie did their vocals separately without hearing each other as they sang their part. That is pretty awesome. Love it. Love those two. I was listening to David Bowie this morning jamming out. We are going to time travel just a second back to October 30th of 2018 because that's when Chad emails Lori the light and dark scales for her family. The subject is family history documents. The body says, here are the family history documents you requested. Melanie Gibb told authorities that Chad was the one who came up with the framework for this whole light, dark scale, how many times you've been on earth and all that stuff. So here's how the light and dark scales work, according to Melanie Gibb. If you are a 2.0, you've been on earth once and this is your first time. If you are a 3.1, this is your second time on Earth. Is still not decided if you're a 3.1, if you're light or dark yet, to be determined. So when you hit 4.1, you have to make a contract with either Satan or Jesus. That's when your numbers start rising up to the 8s and the 9s. You can go from light to dark, but, and very conveniently for Lori, Chad, and Alex, going from dark to light is pretty much impossible. Because, you know, when people ticked them off or weren't needed, they were dark spirits. And we know what happened to these four innocent people because of all this hogwash. He also did a trust scale. We'll do that later. And so vibrations, we talked about that a bit. Chad would use a pendulum. And at a thousand, you're either beginning your translation or you're translated. As you get higher in your vibrations, you can portal. Dude, I want a portal so bad, but I don't want to join this wackadoodle cult. So I'll just be happy right here. So how did he rank members of Lori's family? Well, I'm not going to do everybody because we're just going to touch on the people who are relevant in this upcoming trial. Well, of course, Lori was a 4.3 light. Her brother, Alex Cox, he was a two light, which means this was his first time piddling around here on earth. Colby was a three light. That's her son. That's Lori's son. Now, his wife, probably soon to be ex-wife, I would imagine, three dark. So I don't think Lori liked her. If you remember, Colby said that Lori always treated him more like a boyfriend than a son. And there was some competition there with Lori as far as his wife was concerned. Charles was a three light. Melanie's Lori's niece, three light, her husband, Brandon, three dark. Get this, Tylee was a 4.1 dark. Her sister, Summer, three light. Joe Ryan, 4.3 dark and is now sealed away. And JJ, sweet little JJ, was a 4.2 light. So that's how everybody ranked on Chad's visions of who was a light spirit and who was a dark spirit. It's very easy to me if you look through this list to see clearly who Lori might have talked negatively about to Chad because Joe Ryan, we heard last night on that episode, she wanted him dead. He died. Whether it's a coincidence or something more nefarious, we will never know. He was cremated. Tylee, unfortunately, her only daughter, 4.1 dark and JJ 4.2 light Colby of course light as well so you you could kind of tell who who Lori expressed she liked and who she didn't care for by the way I have a blondie shirt on people are like you never tell us anymore who you're who you're wearing but I always have a rock shirt on for the most part it's hard for me when I do like tv stuff now because I really just want to wear my Stevie Nicks shirt or my Pink Floyd shirt but you know 
had to go shopping for some some girly clothes because you tomboy here. I, listen, I have not dressed up this much since Murdoch, like in my whole life. All right. So we left off with Charles finding Lori's dance videos that Chad had requested Lori send him. In the house where Charles was murdered, there are mirrors everywhere. So anywhere she turned, she could see herself. Well, she forgot to delete the sent messages out of the box. And guess who found them? Charles. He became suspicious. Now, Lieutenant Ron Ball said in his affidavit of probable cause that Melanie Gibb told them that the term zombie refers to an individual whose mortal spirit has left their body and that their body is now the host of another spirit. The new spirit in a zombie is always considered a dark spirit. And while the dark spirit inhabits the host's body, the person's true spirit is in limbo and it's stuck. And the only way to release that limbo spirit is to physically kill the body. I swear, I think Chad's religion was a ripoff of like The Walking Dead and Harry Potter and maybe a couple of other movies, but it's not very original. So in January, Chad, Lori, and Melanie Gibb are on Jason Mao's podcast, Time to Warrior Up. We talked about Jason Mao last night. On January 11th of 2019, all of this is taking place in 2019. So when I say a date, it's 2019. Zulema has a vision. She could create storms and fire and will have the eye of the Lord. January 19th, Lori tells Charles she is a god assigned to carry out the work of the 144,000 at Christ's second coming in July of 2020. Can you imagine those two knuckleheads sitting in their cells on July, in July of 2020, waiting? And then you wait, and then the clock strikes midnight, and you're still waiting, and you're like, well, I'm sure to them it was one of those things where, oh, we're incarcerated, and this is persecution, and it'll happen when it happens. Although, you know, I was like, I hope to goodness they don't think they caused COVID, because she was arrested right around that time that COVID came in the picture. She was arrested in February of 2020. I, I remember thinking, Lord, I hope she ain't sitting in there saying, told you so. January 22nd of 2019, Lori gets an email from Chad with the subject line demon with a name that says Nick Schneider. Now it changes to Ned Schneider. It kind of flip flops sometimes. He says Charles is now a demon. Ned was the first name that he came up with. It switched to Garrett for a hot minute and then ended up being Iplos. Iplos is a combination of evil spirits. Ned was supposed to be some childhood friend of Charles's whose spirit never left the earth and eventually attached itself to Charles's body and pushed his spirit out of his body. Melanie Gibbs said she was present when Chad told Lori this over the phone in early of 2019 in reference to Charles being possessed. Lori then told Melanie Gibbs. Lori also said Chad and Lori believed they were part of the Church of the Firstborn and their job was to rid the world of zombies. January 23rd, Charles finds the email with those light, dark ratings. And later on in March, he forwards that to his sister, Kay Woodcock, who we know is the grandmother of little JJ. Oh, boy. So January 27th, Chad emails Lori a list of their multiple probations. Chad said in one probation, he was James the Just, married to Elena. Elena comes in later. Elena is Lori. And he wrote this, y'all, I'm telling you, it was like an SNL skit because it was supposed to be this hot erotic story and it just flopped. And I mean, I look, I did a recording of it, but I have high school kids. I can't put it out there if their friends see it. I said that yesterday, but it was bad, a loin fire. But in that probation, they had seven children. Two of those children were JJ and Melanie's, Lori's niece. In another probation, Lori was the niece of Jesus, and Judas was her half-brother. How appropriate is that, that her half-brother would be Judas? Two of their other kids, one was a tall high school quarterback, which I think probably is what Chad always dreamed to be. So he said, here's what our son was in another probation. One of their daughters was one of the dream girls. So January 28th, Lori transfers $10,000 out of Charles's business account. She also transfers 2,000 Enterprise rental car points to herself. 
The same day Chad searches on Google for Ned Schneider, 1996 death, Louisiana. Ned Schneider, Louisiana. Ned Schneider, Louisiana, born 1951, died 1996. He also Googled bodies possessed after original occupant dies. It, it's just important to note that these searches are happening six months before Charles, Charles Vallow is murdered by Alex Cox, Lori's brother, and who everybody calls the family hitman. So Charles traveled for business very frequently, and then on January 29th, he goes to Houston to do some business. Lori called him and said, hey, you're not Charles anymore. You're Ned Schneider. He said, according to Charles, Lori said she would kill him, destroy him financially, and nobody would care because he's not Charles. She said an angel would help her dispose of his body, and she also tells him, guess what? I'm a translated being now who cannot taste death. And that she was sent here by God to lead the 144,000 into the millennium. What does Charles do? What any sensible person was do? Files an order of protection. January 30th, Lori transfers $25,000 from Charles's business account, which leaves Charles unable to make his payroll. Lori was listed as an owner of the business, so she was able to do all that. And there wasn't anything, unfortunately, Charles could do. Also, on January 30th, Chad Daybell does another Google search for Ned Schneider, Louisiana obituary, 1997. On a side note, Zulema said she first heard of Charles being a zombie in December 2018 or early January 2019. She heard this while she was having a lunch date with Melanie Gibb and Lori. The same day, on the 30th at 1220 p.m., Charles sends Lori a text. It says, did you disconnect my iPhone from JJ's iPad? I got an email, or did our little guy do it? Lori responds, I'm just leaving the temple, so you know I don't know how to do that. And she puts a sideways smiley face. What does she do when she gets home? She takes all of Charles's things, leaving just a little bit of clothing behind, some food storage in a closet. Melanie Gibbs said Lori was in the office in their house looking for paperwork, important documents, passports, and computers. She also changed the locks. When he was out of town, he would leave his truck at the airport. And he did this time. He was out of town. But Lori's brother, Alex, what does he do? Goes and gets the truck out of that parking lot and hides it at a hotel in Gilbert, Arizona. So at this point, Charles is still in Texas and he tells Lori, hey, I'm coming home tonight. Investigators note there's no indication of trouble between them prior to this. Charles tries to fly home, but Lori canceled his ticket, so he has to spend $600 when he's already cash-strapped because she's drained him dry to get a new ticket to fly back to Arizona. When he gets there, finds his truck is missing, and when he goes to the house, it's empty. In an interview with investigators in October of 2020, Colby, Lori's son, said he knew that the truck was being taken. In fact, Charles called him to ask if he knew where the truck was, but he didn't. And he didn't know what was going on. Lori had told Colby that Charles was having an affair and financially supporting two women in California and also had been with escorts. I call bull on that because Charles adored Lori. And the other thing is she does this thing. And, and, and if you followed this case from the beginning, you deep dive these documents. She will say things about people that she projects, really. It's the, a lot of this stuff she did herself. But to get everybody on her side to be sympathetic, it's always the other person's fault. Colby also said Lori told him that she was going to be killed for her life insurance money by family members. He said he didn't buy all of it. He didn't trust Charles, though, with everything that was happening. So January 30th, the same day, 4.06 p.m., Lori texts her mom. Her sister, which I'm going to put a picture of Summer up here. We have not had a picture of her yet. And text Melanie and Alex. And the text said, please don't answer the phone if Charles calls you. We are in a big argument and he's looking for people to be on his side. Thank you. I love you all. And that's just preemptive strike is what that is. She's getting her side out. I'm the victim. He's going to want people on his side against me. Don't talk. But at 4.14, Charles texts Lori, I'll come home tomorrow. I'll get JJ as you asked and go to Louisiana. I don't want you to, de to destroy me as you said. 4.33 p.m. the same day, Charles calls the Gilbert Police Department. 
from Texas and said Lori was acting strange and making threats. He said Lori told him he was, quote, Ed Schneider. It's hard to keep up with all these stupid names they gave him. And she was going to destroy him. So Gilbert police instructed Charles to follow up with Community Bridges, which is a place in the community you can go, file a report, then a doctor looks over it and decides whether or not they want to issue an involuntary hold on somebody to have them evaluated. At 4.38, five minutes after he calls Gilbert PD, he texts Lori, please call me. Lori responds to him, too late for words, I'm done. So between 6 and 10 p.m., Charles is flying from Dallas back to Phoenix. Lori calls Charles after he gets home and says she's at a hotel with JJ and she doesn't want anything to do with the kids anymore. She says she will drop JJ off at school the next day and Charles can pick him up. Melanie Gibb asks Lori, are you being a little extreme? And Lori says this is God's will. So Charles reaches out to Community Bridges and files his report. They issue a pickup order for Lori. That is involuntary. She doesn't have a choice. At 7.20 p.m., Charles is seen on body cam video with officers expressing his concern for Lori. He says she's lost her mind, took all of their money, took his truck, and talked about all the threats she made. In the video, you notice he's really nervous. Also, he talks about my kids. He's worried about them, meaning JJ and Tylee. So these officers, if you watch all these body cam videos, it's very frustrating because there are maybe one or two out of all of them that actually listen to him most dismiss his claims. And I think that that's a problem we have here, probably across the world, is that men can be victims of domestic violence, mental abuse. And, but for some reason, it's just not taken as seriously as if the tables were turned and Lori was the one making these reports. I fully believe that. Also, I think if there were some things done at this time, January of 2019, we may ne never have known any of their names. So it's, it's just very sad to, to look back on what could have been done and what was not done. And then the end result. So the officer's like, well, what makes her a threat to herself and others? And Charles is like, well, she threatened to murder me. Charles points to a man in a car there with him. He is a bishop and says that the bishop heard Lori say she would destroy Charles. But the officer, what does he say? That's not a threat. Charles says this has been going on for four to five years as far as her religious beliefs getting more and more extreme. But it's gotten worse lately with her going to temple daily, saying she's speaking to Moroni and Jesus. Now, if you put this kind of in a time frame, this fits the four to five years. That fits when an anonymous friend of hers said she became obsessed with Chad's books. So there you go. Charles says he wants to have Lori picked up now. And asks if they have a pickup order. The officer says they do. And Charles says, if she doesn't answer, what do we do? The officer says, if she doesn't answer, we can't enforce the order. Now, I looked up the process for the mental health pickup in Arizona. And here's what I found. Now, I'm not claiming this to be the gospel, but this is what it says. What happens once I complete a petition? Number one, the petition is reviewed within three days by a provider who determines if an evaluation is needed. Number two, if the petition is accepted by the provider, a pickup order is sent to police. That's where we are now with Lori in this timeline. Number three, the police will go to the location of the person and take them to the provider. Number four, the person will be involuntarily admitted for an evaluation. And number five, the provider has 24 hours to evaluate if the person will continue with the court-ordered evaluation. They can extend that to like 72 hours. In some states, it's called a 5150 hold. You can't do nothing about it. January 31st, Lori's sister, Summer. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead just a bit. My bad. The officers ask about him saying, did she say anything about harming the children? Charles said just what she said today. And the cop said, well, that's subjective. And the cop said, take the kids. I don't care. And then Charles repeats what Lori said. I don't care what happens to them. The cop said, that's not a direct threat to harm the kids. The cop said it sounds like everything she said was carefully subjected and crafted. The cop says, we don't know she took your truck. So he advised him to contact the Phoenix Police Department to initiate a stolen car report. But for tonight, 
The officer says we have no crime. At 11.38 p.m., Gilbert PD received an emergency health petition for Lori that was completed by Charles. It was an involuntary hold for a 72-hour observation at Community Bridges. So now we can jump back to what I said earlier when I was a little early on it. So Lori's sister, Summer, texts Lori on January 31st at 8.55 a.m. and says she has heard Charles has a pickup order for a psych eval and something about having her temple recommend suspended until they were able to talk to Lori. Summer says she 100% supports Lori and says Charles is showing his extreme evil and malicious intent in trying to have her temple recommend suspended. She ends the text saying, I know you are being inspired to know what to do and you are prepared to do your mission. I support you. I love you. I'm here for you. I'm sorry you have to go through all this crap. So 9.09 a.m. while Lori is inside taking JJ to school, Charles gets Lori's purse from her car. His intent was, hey, I'll just force her to stay here. She can be picked up and taken for her eval because her keys were in her purse. But guess what? Lori had another set of keys. So what does Charles do? He finds which hotel Lori is staying at. And the exchange with police is, again, caught on body cam. He pretty much tells the same story as the night before. The female cop asks if he can track her location with his iPhone. And he said, this is her phone. So the cop's like, uh, how'd you get that? And he said it was in her car at the school. He took her keys so she couldn't leave, but somehow obviously had another set of keys thinking it would have a key. And he took the wallet thinking it would have a key to the hotel room that she was staying at. He asks if they can go in the room with him to see if she's there. And the female cop says, no, we're not allowed to just go in there. She said they're waiting on their sergeant because the sergeant has the pickup order and then they can knock on the door. But they have to have that paperwork in hand to do it, to knock the, on the door. And if she's there, which she wasn't, they can take her. Charles explains Lori will pick JJ up from school. He's just trying to get an opportunity for them to pick Lori up and take her for this evaluation. One officer tells Charles he needs to be real careful following her around. And Charles says, look, I'm not doing that. The officer says, well, we're at her hotel. He says he's not irrational at all. He just wants to get her help. He said, she's my wife. I love her to death. I don't want to hurt her. And I don't want her to hurt anyone else. The officer says, I think your priority should be there right now. I think he's talking about JJ. And Charles says, it is. The officer says, if you don't feel comfortable with her state of mind, find a way to keep JJ safe. So Charles says he's going to his attorney's office to file paperwork for a restraining order. And he says something which is partially bleeped out. And it mentions his sister, Kay Woodcock. He says he has some stuff to do in Houston. And he says Lori can have the house, whatever she wants. And he says she took $35,000. She's got money to last a while. Oh, no, Lori, don't. That's like a week in Lori's world. Charles says Lori will be at the school in and out to get JJ. And the officer says, if she's as irrational as you say, I would get him out of school and prevent that from happening. Charles says he might do that, but the only place he knows she will be is there and she needs help. She needs serious help. I want her to get help. I'm worried about her. I don't think we as a couple will survive this, but she needs help. And I think that's the only place we're going to find her is at JJ's school. So the officer says, if you see her, you can call us. And Charles says, if she picks JJ up at 345 and she's in and out, it takes you guys 20 minutes to get there. Well, the male officer says, we're not going to do a sting operation. Charles says it's not a sting. So what does Charles do? He's a gentleman and he shakes all the officer's hands and says he really appreciates it. The female cop says, good luck. Charles has the patience of a saint with these cops because they just really were very dismissive and it's not the first nor the last time. So in the report, the male cop wrote, it says that Charles's demeanor was strange for someone in his circumstances, and he was more concerned about the legalities of the money she withdrew than her alleged incoherence. In the report, it also says he expressed a desire to leave quickly and handle financial matters at the bank. I pointed out to Charles that he said Lori was unstable. Charles didn't seem concerned with his child's welfare and said the child could stay in school and perhaps we could catch Lori. He left to go to the bank. See, that's exactly what I'm talking about. 
What this officer doesn't know is that Lori drained the business account. It opens Charles up to lawsuits. He can't make his payroll. These are people that depend on their money. So, yeah, he's got to go to the bank. And for the time being, J.J. most likely is safe in school. Lori's not going to go get him early. She doesn't want to deal with J.J. at this point. We all know that, unfortunately. Boy, I tell you. Melanie Gibb texts Lori just to check on her. So, the response that she gets, hey, Come over to the house, bring the truck. And what about those keys to the truck? So when Melanie Gibb gets there, she realizes it was Charles who responded because he had Lori's phone. Melanie Gibb asks, is Lori here? Charles is like, no, but I need to talk to you. Melanie Gibb told investigators later on it was so uncomfortable, but looking back now, her heart breaks for Charles. But I haven't, I, you know, words are one thing, but she was all into this whole Charles is a demon theory. She, she knew the mindset of these people and she did nothing and she said nothing and she didn't go to the police. So a little late in my book to say my heart breaks for Charles. It's just lip service. Oh boy. I, it just really, Oh, it's so sad. Nobody listened to Charles. Nobody, nobody. He expressed his concern to Melanie Gibb and she hugged him and left. So what does Melanie Gibb do? She calls Chad wanting to know where Lori is, but Melanie Gibbs not really supposed to know Chad's kind of into Lori, so he acts dumb. Then she gets a call from Lori on a new line she got since Charles has her phone. And as she's driving off, she sees Jason Mao, who we talked about yesterday, the host of that Time to Warrior Up podcast. He's pulled over near a park, and she talks to him. By the way, Jason Mao is ex-police. He was hurt on the job, and I believe he had to take like a medical retirement or something like that. But Melanie Gibb tells him about the purse, and he suggests they go file a police report, and Lori agrees to that. So Melanie Gibb said before they went to the police station about that stolen purse, she followed Lori as Lori drove the truck to another location, Charles's truck, which was near some temple off the highway. Now, Charles gets wind Lori's going to go file a report, so what does he do? He calls 911 twice while Lori is filing the complaint about taking your purse. So the first call is him telling dispatch that Lori is there at the Gilbert Police Department right now, filing a report about her purse, and that the officer he spoke to won't hold her because he doesn't have the active order. So Charles, again, can you get the order to him ASAP? He says she's in the lobby right now. She has blonde hair. The dispatch says, I'll call right now. So he calls back. He says the same thing, essentially, and says she needs serious help. So dispatch says, didn't you just call? And he said, yes. Dispatch says, okay, it's been less than 10 minutes since you called. Dispatch says they will call him back. He says Lori is still there and he is bringing her purse. So Lori, Tylee, and Melanie Gibb visit the Gilbert PD at 1236 p.m. to do this report. Lori goes to the police station to file a statement about the theft. However, she only wants to document it. She doesn't want to press charges. I think because she knew it would be a very big risk financially to do that because maybe Charles would just divorce her and be done and that's it. Or if this falls through with Chad and the wackadoodle group, she'd go back to Charles because he loved her enough that he would probably take her back. It's really hard to watch Tylee. She's very nervous, uh, fidgety with her hands, constantly kind of moving her hands. She says, she tells the officer, her friend who was a police officer named Jason Mao, she name drops, told her to file a police report. So according to Lori, she tells the officer, yesterday I was arguing with my husband on the phone. He was in Texas working and I found some stuff that he had been doing. So he was really defensive. So I took the kids and spent the night in a hotel because I knew he was coming home. This morning when I took my son to school, I went into the school to take him in and Charles was waiting somewhere and he stole my purse out of my car, my phone, my wallet, my money, my everything. She said she had the door locked, but the sunroof was open because JJ's service dog was inside the car. She said JJ was throwing a fit because he didn't have his stuff since they slept at a hotel and she didn't want to have to get him and the dog out. She said she didn't have the door locked for the first time ever, though. It's, it's, it's a contradiction. And she said she doesn't remember if the door was locked or if he reached through the sunroof and got it out. Then he started texting all my family and friends, impersonating me. It was Melanie Gibb. It wasn't all just let's blow it out of proportion to get some sympathy, which actually works. The cop totally buys into it. 
And she said, got my friend lured over to the house to meet where he had kicked in the door to get in the house, which I'm glad we weren't there. Well, he kicked in the door because you changed the locks, you meanie. Melanie Gibbs said when she got there, she was like, Lori. And she says he texted my phone. Lori says he texted her Melanie Gibb pretending to be me to get Melanie Gibb at the house. Melanie said Charles asked if she could come inside the house now. She said she told Charles, you've been using Lori's phone to connect with me. And Charles says, sorry, I've deceived you. Melanie Gibbs said she told him, yes, you did. She said there were other people there, somebody in a white suburban. She said she assumed it was Lori, but she didn't see Lori's car there. She said Charles asked her what's gotten into Lori. Where is she? And Melanie Gibbs said, of course, I didn't say where she was. And I didn't know where she was. Lori said she didn't tell anyone where she was because she thought it was safer. Melanie said she thinks Charles wanted her to take his side. Lori said he changed the locks and was telling Melanie Gibb how crazy she was and stuff like that. You know, saying truth. The officer asked if stuff like this is common. And of course, Lori says yes. They've had to go to hotels in the past until he calms down. The officer asked what motivates these situations, and Lori says he just goes nuts sometimes. Project, project. She said this time she caught him cheating, and she had evidence and told him about it and said he travels a lot, and she found out about it and told him not to come back home. This is where her voice gets very forceful. Tylee actually has to reach over and pat Lori to calm her down. It's like Tylee's put in the adult situation, and Lori is the hyper kid. You know how your kids are when they're trying to convince you of something that's not true. They get loud because if you're loud, maybe it'll sink in deeper. She said she left with the kids because she didn't want them in all the drama. So the cop said, he took your phone and your purse and he tried to contact you. And Lori said, yes. Then through Melanie Gibb. At this point, Tylee is shaking her head. Yes. Lori says she has no way to be contacted. He has her phone. Lori went to buy a throwaway phone just so she could have one. When asked if Charles tried to give her stuff back, Lori said he talked to Melanie Gibb. Melanie Gibb asked Charles if he would be willing to give her the purse for Lori, and Charles says no, not unless she does this, this, and this. Melanie Gibb did not specify what this meant. The officer said, look, I need more specifics. So Lori said to meet at therapy, which is, I assume, for JJ, and he would give it to her. Lori said she doesn't want to talk to him today, and she if she doesn't have to. The cop says, if we have him bring the purse back, are we all good? Lori says, I don't want to meet him in person. He's very sneaky. What he'll do is meet me in the parking lot and mess around with me. And the officer asks, what if they facilitate the exchange there at the police station? And Lori's like, yes, that'll be fine. So he asked Tylee what Charles texted her the night before. And Tylee said, he basically texted me and Lori interrupts and said he was texting JJ was in danger. And Tylee puts her hand out like and shuts as you're like, shut up, mom. Tylee said at first he texts me, are you doing OK today? He says, tell your mom I may not be home for a bit. Love you. Then he sent a text of a strange link to a website about their church. And then he texted me at almost midnight saying, I'm sorry. I'm, and it's redacted, something about danger, I have no choice. He was acting like he did something. He and, and I think maybe it's a little confusing there, but I think what he's talking about is maybe trying to explain to Tylee the community bridges that he filed with that pickup order. She said he didn't file a police report as far as we know, so she was assuming that Charles was just trying to get a response. He told Tylee he loved her. And she said he was sending word for word the same text to her cousin, which I'm assuming is Zach Cox, who was living with them. Lori said, my friend who's a police officer said, go file a report, file a restraining order, all this stuff. I didn't want to do all that. I just want my purse back. That would be lovely. I'm really mad about my lip gloss. And the cop's like, hey, that's so funny. See, she uses this charm. And wins people over and then things aren't as emergent. It's scary how she turns crazy off. That's why 100% if she has mental illness, that's not for me to question, but culpable as all get out in these murders. You parade crazy. You don't hide it. In the police interview with Charles, I've said this every time we've had this on an episode. If she truly were that far gone, she would say, yeah, we shot Charles, but it wasn't, it wasn't Charles. 
it was Iplos. We didn't kill Charles. We killed Iplos. Charles was already gone. What does she do? Makes up an elaborate story that doesn't click with the other two's version. She's given a victim's advocate within 30 minutes of being in that interrogation room after the murder of Charles. She's good at what she does, y'all. Oh, man. It, 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 I feel so bad for Charles. Um, Lori also said, he has all my cards. I took all the money out of our account, but it's a joint account, so he wants me to give him money. The cop said, hey, that's a civil issue, not my bag. First, there's no reason he's walking around with your purse, your ID, that he doesn't have a right to. And Lori says, all the rest of the stuff is ours together jointly. The cop says, I'm going to leave the room and call Charles to see if they can just get the purse back. He calls Charles and says, you realize the purse doesn't belong to you. The money is a civil issue. You also texted a friend to meet you under the guise you were Lori. What was that all about? Charles says that was this morning. You can't hear what Charles is saying on this. They've read the report from last night about him being locked out. Charles mentions the community bridges pickup order and the cop says he doesn't have the order in front of him and he can't do it. The sergeant would have to call to verify the order is good and then get dispatched to pick her up. The officer says he can't keep someone against their will. He says, you come in and bring her purse and the sergeant can call the doctor. He says, we don't have that. And for all we know, it's not valid anymore. He said, I'm not discussing that. It's a separate issue. I'm discussing her getting her belongings back. So there you go. This cop could have called Community Bridges and said, hey, look, we've got a husband here saying he's got a pickup order and she's here. Can you guys send that over really quickly while she's here? That cop could have made some small talk. She would have talked his ears off about her lip gloss and her ID and everything else. Okay, so you're saying it's at the house. This is the cop talking, which you changed the locks to which she doesn't have access to. Unless you want to be charged with theft, we need to get that purse back to her. So if you want to come here with the purse and the order, we can try to get it all figured out. So Charles agrees to come and the cop asks, how soon can he be there? The cop says he's coming with the purse and the order. And one cop said, this should get interesting. They're talking out in the hall, by the way. And the other cop says, real interesting. So they go back into the room and it's redacted for a minute, but clearly the officer mentions the pickup order for Lori. And he says, until a sergeant verifies it's valid, he has no intention of holding her against her will. But if it's verified by the sergeant, which could take a little while, in other words, let's go, come on out the door. Uh, I'll have to take you to community bridges. And he tells her it's a mental health behavior place. But while it's being verified, I have no right to keep you or hold you. He's en route with your purse and your phone and the order, which needs to be verified. While the order is being verified, you do what you feel you need to do. And Lori very softly says, okay. The officer says, how we're going to get that to go away, I do not know. Get that to go away. This guy knows nothing. He's been charmed by her there. And he has no clue about any of this other stuff. He could have read the police report and read all the crazy things she was saying. But no, we have got to get away with this stuff. You could probably contact Community Bridges. This is committal paperwork. They can hold you for 24, 48 hours, however long they deem necessary to get you evaluated based just off of what your husband thinks. And then Lori says, I just think it's funny because, and then Tylee puts her arm on Lori and Lori shuts up. Lori says quietly, because I'm the one who did something wrong. And she said it very sarcastic. The officer says, I don't know, and I'm not going to take sides. Buddy, you're taking sides. Come on. But just talking to you, I don't see you being a danger to yourself or anyone. You got your kids to school, but I'm letting you know, if you're here and we get the order, I will have to take you with force if necessary, if you're here and it's approved. The officer says, I don't know how he got it. And Lori said, that's what I don't get. He got that in the middle of the night. Wasn't it closed? Lori says, so they'll be looking for me. And the officer says they don't bust down doors, but they will knock. So if you see officers knocking, talk to them through the door if you really don't want to go. So if you need a free medical or a psychological evaluation, Lori interrupts. She says, I was about to say, I haven't had sleep in three days. Do they have good facilities? And they're all like, ah, that's so funny. And the cop says, they do from what I understand. Lori says, do they have a gym where I can work out? Lori turns to Tylee and says, you'll be okay without your mama. And Tylee laughs and says, you're going to get a padded room. So everyone laughs. 
Lori asks, how can you get a mental order? And the officer said it depends on what Charles told them. And usually they'll do it just to be safe. Tylee asked, do you know what he said? And the officer said no. So a cop said he needed to step out. And the other asks if he should come. And he said, no, you can stay here and entertain them. And Tylee says, do you know any knock-knock jokes? I thought that was pretty cute. Lori says Tylee's a high school graduate at 16 and she's applying to the academy, meaning the police academy. She's totally lying here, right? She got her GED and is moving on with life. And the officer says, oh, you want to be a police officer? And Tylee says, mm, very awkwardly, maybe, you never know. The cop says, then you can look forward to this kind of stuff, meaning the situation they're in now. So the officer said he's new out of the academy, and this is more of a unique call that he's seen so far. He steals your phone, and now there's a petition. Lori says something about him saying, I'm sorry I had to do it. I was worried about J.J., and Lori said it was six hours and JJ was at school and Tylee said Charles had been out of town. Melanie said she was leaving the house after Charles conned her to come over and says, I see our good friend. A police officer, Jason Mal, just pulled over beside me and I thought to myself, I'll tell him what's going on. And he said, go to the police office now. Lori said she was going to come herself after he took the purse, but obviously he's lurking around here and that's creepy by itself. Tally said, and your keys are normally in your purse, but Lori said she carried them in her hand. She said JJ was throwing a fit on the ground, so it was a rough morning. The cop asked whose white car Charles was driving, and Melanie and Lori both say Charles doesn't have any buddies. Charles had buddies. Lori said he changed the locks on her, and he's also on the lease. She said he's trying to lock me out because I'm whatever. Melanie said she's so glad those other guys were there so she wasn't alone with Charles. Lori said, you were just trying to be a good friend to me. She said Charles has access to all of her contacts. He is calling and telling all of her friends how crazy she is. The cop asked, is this recent? And Tylee said it's been 24 hours. Lori said not to this extreme, but he's been ballistic enough to where they've had to leave and the reason she did, according to her, is because she didn't want Charles to hurt one of the kids or something. Or Tylee said three to four times is about the amount of time she can remember as far as Charles actually going ballistic. So the phone rings and the cop asked if it's Tylee and Lori. I'm sorry, a phone rings and the cop asks, who is it? And Lori said it's actually her mom's old broken phone that she's using. Lori says they're going to have to add Jason and Thor and all their friends into the contact list. I'm not getting into Thor and all that. It's just another rabbit hole. We're keeping it, you know, this is all detailed, but it's what you got to know if you're going to follow this trial. It's deep, y'all. The cop asked Tylee her name and mentions the different last name than Lori. Tylee said Charles is her stepdad and Lori said since Tylee was three. The cop said it takes a while to verify the order and Lori asked if Charles is there and if there's a separate exit they can use not to see him. And the cop says they definitely will facilitate that. So Tylee asks about her mom potentially being gone to community bridges if Charles can pick JJ up or if she can and take him back to the hotel. So the cop says she can. Whatever you guys work out. The cop asks if she's worried about going back to the house and she said now she is since he's changed all the locks. The cop says, so this all stems from him cheating and you finding out about it. And Lori shakes her head. Yes. And he asked if she had proof. And she said, yes. Now, Melanie Gibb told investigators in October of 2021 about this visit. Lori told her she knew how to handle the police. There you go. Melanie Gibb said when the officer asked Lori if she had proof of Charles's affair, because that's that's the whole basis of this blow up, according to Lori. But when Melanie Gibb asked Lori, did you really have proof? She said, nope. Gosh, it's amazing, y'all. When asked why she lied about that, Melanie Gibb said to her she thought he was Ned Schneider. But nobody would believe her, so she painted a picture of him in a bad way to police to make him look bad. We are nearly done with this episode, y'all. The cop asked Tylee's plans since she's got her GED. She said she may start community college and eventually transfer to a university. Lori says she's working right now, and Tylee says yes, but they redact out where she said she was working. The cop says as long as you're good talking to people, that's part of the job. The cop asks about Jason Mao, and Melanie tells the story of him getting hurt with his hamstring being pulled off the bone. 
It took him three years to walk again. The police says it was a pre-existing condition. It took him two years to walk again. They say he has a business to help police officers. So the officer leaves and calls the bishop that was with Charles, and the cop said he's listed as a witness of an involuntary commitment. He asks to know what happens later on. He said it's a tough situation, but Lori has been getting into some religious stuff that's bothered him, and their relationship had been a bit odd for a few months and came to a head when he went out of town. Charles had him list, listen to a conversation, this is the bishop, with Lori that was strange, but nothing threatening or terroristic of any kind. She did cancel his flight, and his truck was gone with the house locked up. He said third parties have told him that Lori is okay, the kids are okay, and they're staying at a hotel. He said he hasn't talked to Charles in a bit. She did not threaten him or the kids, but she, he did hear Lori say, I will destroy you. The bishop says it didn't come across as a direct threat to her, Charles, or the kids. He said it seems coherent, but her statements were irrational. She was accusing him of something, but wouldn't say what it was. She indicated he wasn't Charles, but what concerned the bishop was he said, I just want the kids. And she said, I'll give them to you. Why is this cop not like listening to this and going in there being like, can y'all hurry up with this order? Because maybe I'm hearing from a third party that doesn't have a dog in the fight that maybe she's 50 shades of cray. But no, the bishop did say she sounded lucid as she was speaking. The investigator said in his time with Lori, it was her in a normal state of mind, but slightly upset she didn't have her property. She showed no signs of mental distress and was in a good mood. They verified the petition and encouraged her to talk to the employees at Community Bridges and actually offered a ride for her to there. They discussed with Lori uh, the petition a little more, and Lori was confused just how Charles, according to her, can make stuff up and get her involuntarily committed. The officer told her the petition did exist and encouraged her to take care of it, and if she didn't, he would have to take her without her consent. Lori said, I'll go on my own. Tylee chimes in and says, I will make sure she does. The officer said after this conversation, he did not feel the need at this moment to take her there. So we're going to end it here. And then this also just is part of the beginning of that downward spiral that begins to come to a head June 11th when Charles is murdered. Now, she is facing charges in Arizona for Charles's murder. And even though Charles is not part of this trial, his murder is not part of the trial coming up next month in Idaho. It's relevant to go through this stuff because it shows Lori's manipulation and her frame of mind and how she got everybody to think that Charles was the crazy one when really it was her. And that is scary. All we, there's no telling how many people we know like this who not to this degree, but who are very good at shutting things off. And how many times have you heard one person's side of the story and bought it and ran with it and never get that second side of the story? And I think that's the biggest thing that bothers me, too, about Lori's family, with the exception of Adam and Zach Cox. I know people have a problem with Adam because later on he's supposed to meet Charles at the house that day to go get JJ. That's the day Charles was murdered. I don't know what their relationships were like. It might not be that people felt the need to be Velcroed. I'm not going to judge, but everybody in that family took Lori's word for it. They knew she was talking crazy. I've heard that maybe a couple of family members might have shared her beliefs, but like Zach Cox, totally just what I consider, they're all living victims. I mean, you know, you're going to be defensive to the one you love, but at the same time, poor Zach. I need to find that interview with Justin Lum and post it because he's just heartbroken talking about Tylee, it's like he said she wanted to say something to me. And this was after Charles was murdered and they were at Lori's parents' house. But Lori's mom kind of got Tylee by the shoulder and got it or passed him. And it bothered him that he never got to talk to her again. And he breaks down and bless his heart. There's so many living victims in this case. You look at Charles's family, you look at Lori's family, you look at the friends of Tylee and JJ and Tammy and Tammy's children and her parents. There's so many living victims, y'all. Just so much pain that these people will endure for the rest of their life. And it's at the hands, really, of three people. Lori, Chad, and Alex. Next month, let's hope she stands trial for this. Although, we had a hearing today, y'all. And guess what? Judge Boyce has got to rule 
on some late evidence that was received by the defense. And it was late. So like a day late, but late. So I'm a little nervous that maybe the judge, I don't know how it's going to work. I need to talk to Lori Hellis or Scott Reich or one of them smart legal people that I'm not. How could that affect the trial? I mean, would she have to give up her right to a speedy trial to be able to go through all this evidence? Will Judge Boyce not allow the evidence in because that it was given late? I don't know. Also, a couple things I wanted to show you guys. You remember me talking about like Chad? Okay, so here are some pictures of Chad delivering his speeches at the Preparing of People events or maybe his Buy My Books. Uh, I need to make my $2,000 this year. Okay, but look at his outfits, right? He's wearing these uh, plaid shirts. I mean, okay, I, I look, I ain't, I ain't making fun of the way he dresses. But, I mean, he was typical dad. You know he had a pair of white New Balances that every dad wears when they're grilling up some burgers. But then you get what? The glow up with Lori. How it started on the left there. A little fade haircut with some sideburns. A little bit of a different shirt. Some polo shirts. But how did it end? In stripes with a very sad face. That's what happens when you dance with the devil. All right, guys. We'll see you tomorrow for part four. And I'm going to have to start flying through this. But it's important. And I'm not going to leave out anything that, that needs to be in here. So we will do this crash course. It will not be 50-something episodes. I'm thinking maybe four to five more. Uh, I do have some update episodes I'm going to throw in this weekend, especially about the hearings today. Judge Boyce is going to rule, I believe, March 22nd on all this stuff. Motion to dismiss the death penalty. There was a motion in limine about some um, about the, I believe that was about the outstanding discovery. And so he hasn't ruled on any of that yet. So it's he's going to have to get on it because this trial is coming up. I'm leaving here April 2nd to go to Boise. Hey, if you're from Boise, if you're from that area or you know that area, give me some tips of things to do. On the weekends, I'm going to L.A. to visit people, but it doesn't make sense to fly home. It's a whole day to get here. I'll be dead tired only to get back up at 5 a.m. and do it again. But if you know cool things to do in Boise, please, please leave me a comment. Uh, if you're in Boise, we should have a big Boise alibi or meetup. Let's do it. Let's have some coffee, chill out, have some laughs, you know. Uh, these cases are serious and they're sad, but... Uh, we could take a break, right, and meet up and chill out and have some coffee. And, Lord, please let there be a karaoke bar in Boise because you girls going to be there. All right. We will see you tomorrow. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.